Hello and welcome to this evening's Tiger webinar. I'm Lydia Palmer from RIT's Division of Development and Alumni Relations, and I'm your moderator for today's event. We're happy to have you join us today, and we hope that you and our entire Tiger family are well. As we all continue to adapt to this new working environment, we want you to know that RIT's Office of Alumni Relations is available to help all alumni with a variety of needs, including new virtual content, learning opportunities, and networking and career assistance through our current work and life realities. If you are not already connected to the RIT Alumni Association social media channels, including Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, we encourage you to follow these accounts. You will find up-to-date communications and opportunities to connect to other Tiger alumni in your region and your industry through Alumni Association social media. Those links are found in the chat box, and the chat box can be opened by clicking on the chat tab at the right of your webinar window. Many in our RIT family have asked how they can help our students and the university as we respond to the pandemic and prepare for the fall semester. We are incredibly grateful for those offers. There are two ways you can help. First, our new graduates and current students are seeking positions for full-time careers and co-ops, respectively. Many of these positions have been delayed or canceled entirely. If your company is hiring or would consider adding a co-op post, please contact Chris Steeler in RIT's Career Services Office and allow her to post that position in our systems. In addition, as RIT prepares for the return of students in a few short weeks, there is now an unprecedented need for financial aid scholarships for continuing and incoming Tiger students. If you are able, please make a gift at the link in the chat box, and we thank you very much. Now, just a few housekeeping points. We want to ensure that everyone is familiar with the presentation tools. If you are joining from a remote location and are currently signed into your company's VPN, we encourage you to close that channel during the webinar to increase the quality of the transmission. The webinar platform is secure without VPN. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be entered in the chat box at any time throughout the discussion. We will make every effort to address all comments, <clears throat> excuse me, and questions throughout the webinar. You're joining the event using broadcast audio. If you wish to dial in by phone, dial in information is provided in the chat box. Live captioning and ASL interpreting are also being provided and you can find the links to access these in the chat box as well. This webinar will be recorded and made available complete with captions in approximately one week following today's event. All participants will receive an email with the link to the recording. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. And now on to our webinar. Tomorrow is Bastille Day, an important celebration in France, but tonight we begin the celebration with Wines of the World 101, led by RIT lecturer, alumna, sommelier, and wine aficionado, Lorraine Hems, Masters of Science uh, 2012. Lorraine has been in the wine and spirits industry in the, at the retail, wholesale, and educational levels for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. She currently teaches wine and spirits studies as a full-time lecturer in the Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management, now part of Saunders College of Business at RIT. Lorraine is also a certified Bordeaux educator with Le Col du Vin de Bordeaux Sopexa. She stays active in the wine industry through SWE, Women for Wine Sense, and the American Wine Society. And those activities include volunteering, teaching at local events, and presenting at national conferences. In 2012, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Chapter of Women for Wine Sense. Lorraine is an active advocate for the wines of the Finger Lakes, yay, the area she calls home. Even though she is lucky enough to live in such a lovely wine region, she still enjoys traveling, particularly while checking the various wine regions of the world off her spit bucket list while presenting and judging at wine and spirits competitions throughout the world. Tonight's event is offered in partnership with Club McKinsey and the Labazo Alumni House and Saunders College. Club McKenzie programs are named for Provost Emeritus Stan McKenzie, Celebrating Stan's love of learning, laughter, and libation, Club McKenzie is an evening of wit, wisdom, and intellectual stimulation 
featuring favorite RIT presenters. Lorraine is certainly one of those favorites. Happy Bastille Day, Lorraine, and our audience is all yours. Well, thank you very much. Great intro, a little long, you know, so that's why I had the blah, blah, blah. You have to listen to the intro to get to the rest of the stuff, I guess. But um, uh, happy anniversary now also to hospitality program moving back to College of Business. We had been with CAST or now CET for a few years, and we're happy to be back uh, in that program again, that college, and it's exciting to pick up some new friends and uh, new faces. So uh, tonight's going to be a welcome to part one, and uh, we want to have a lot of fun, ask a lot of questions. There's a lot of uh, my former students I know joining us tonight, and they know um, I'm not wine snob. So I'm going to try and condense a 14-week course now into less than an hour, and it's not going to happen. So that's why there will be a part two, but we're just going to have some fun and um, certainly answer some questions. And if we don't get to all of them, we'll certainly uh, have an opportunity to get some answers to you later. But um, I've got a glass of wine, and Lydia had mentioned my love for the Finger Lakes. Uh, this, what I have in my glass right now, I had suggested maybe a French rose, or uh, I have Sheldrake rose from Cayuga Lake that I'm very fond of. But um, I hope whatever you have in your glass at home, come along. So yes, we talked about Bastille Day, which is tomorrow, and why would we talk about that and freedom and celebrations? And well, we haven't had a lot of that around, but um, it really was the marking of the start of the French Revolution. And why France? You know, if I live in the Finger Lakes and I've had an opportunity to travel around the world and different wine regions, why does it always seem to come back to France and French wine? And uh, There's a reason for it. So the reason being, uh, that France is home to some of the most famous wine regions. And we look at them for it, it being embedded in their culture. And so we don't have it here in the U.S., but we've always sort of looked to France as producing the best wine and having uh, the most knowledge about it and maybe trying to be too wine snobby about it as a result. And there's no reason to. But we can thank the French for the diversity of their wines because from north to south, it is, it's quite a ways. And so you'll see different climates. You'll see different uh, soils, certainly, the diversity of the soils. Um, I was in the Burgundy region, and somebody was telling me about the upheaval of the soils during the Jurassic period. And he said, well, you know, it's not like Jurassic Park, the movie. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I get that. So they have so many different things going on, but it really comes down to that basic level of an appreciation of wine and wine going with food, which seems to be something associated with something called old world, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But one of the reasons they're very famous and the rest of the world is really copied, a lot of the grapes we see around the world came from there. The vines came from there. And they did a lot of documenting and uh, setting them forth regulations, documenting uh, the church way back, uh, hundreds of years, documenting uh, rainfall and different flavors that you would get from the grapes from those soils. And then the regulations starting about the 1950s that we copy here in the U.S. and around the world, some form of just sort of understanding maybe a ranking of quality levels so that people know what they're buying, what they're paying maybe that extra money for. So maybe some of it's a little um, supply and demand as far as pricing, but we'll walk through sort of the things that have affected it now. So why France? Because it all sort of started there and the rest of us are following it. But Wine 101, um, when I started teaching, I was like, well, what is wine? And this would be about the most boring explanation. And it really doesn't have any emotional tie for us. It's from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. But what is wine? Uh, that's not what we're here for. Um, an alcoholic beverage, usually fermented juice, and it could be from just grapes or could be something else. So I'm not going to spend time on that explanation because we have other things to talk about. So what is wine really? <clears throat> when you pick up that glass of wine, what is it? What's in it? And it's primarily water. Your grapes start out primarily water. And now through fermentation, we're talking about something that is still a lot of water, but we're picking up a large percentage of alcohol or slightly lower, but there isn't a lot of leftovers. There's not a lot of space for much of anything else. And it's amazing that we get all these different flavors from these different grapes. And how does that come about? Well, 
Um, it's not a set formula. And so uh, I've said in the past, you know, wine is an ever-breathing, uh, ever-changing uh, beverage, and it is. It's not a set formula that you expect. If uh, some of you may have been on campus when it was a Pepsi college, and now it's a Coca-Cola college, and when you put that money in and you hit that machine, that button should be dropping out what you pressed. And it's cola, but there's a difference between colas. Well, it's not a set formula here with, with a syrup, we add water, and whatever all else goes into that. It can also be a wine, a beverage that changes over time, over a few weeks and months and years. Uh, so it's very, very different. And so it's not surprising that people will say, oh, you know, I had that wine again and it, you know, it tasted different, maybe because of different company, maybe because of uh, the place. Maybe you had it in Italy on a hill and now you're sitting um, isolated due to COVID-19 in your home and it might not be as exciting. But wine um, can be very different for different people. It's always going to be personal preference. So it doesn't matter what my preference is. If a student asks me, so what do you like? It really shouldn't matter to you because your taste buds and everything will be very different from mine. And do our taste buds really evolve? Do we really change that much? Well, maybe some of us do. Uh, I have a, a retail background. So when I started out doing retail, I liked everything. And that's sort of how I still approach things, that I could find a good purpose for anything. So personal preference. Don't let anyone ever tell you what you're drinking isn't good. So the question, only made from grapes, uh, that's how the rest of the world views it, and they usually talk about a very specific family of grapes that produce the best wines of the world. But um, hopefully maybe Phil Plummer is on here, and Phil's a former student who did not go to RIT for uh, winemaking, but he makes this incredible cranberry wine that I serve to all of my classes because it's just so good and so unique, and many people don't get to try fruit wines. But when you're in a fruit area of the world, you can use anything. It doesn't have to be just grapes. So be open to a lot of different things and have some fun. So what is wine? What is wine to you? Because I find this to be such a unique uh, subject that the appreciation of wine can bring together people from such different backgrounds. I've been at a wine competition judging with somebody who's in charge of communi communications at the um, Indy Speedway for the Indianapolis 500. And like, well, how does that guy get into this? And he's worked at wineries and he's involved with wineries. And I get that, but such different interests. And you go to people's homes and there might be music in the background and the family dog walks through as you're opening a bottle of champagne and uh, history, music, all of, uh, all of this uh, can bring a lot of different people together. And that's what I see with my classes, that's for sure, because I have a very diver diverse group of students that come in to learn more about wine. So it's a fun one. So I mentioned before something about old world, and old world where these vines were originally planted, where everything really started in the country of Georgia, um, in Europe, um, moving a little bit east out of there, but we see those grapevines being brought to the rest of the world. And so if old world had all these traditions and still maintain these traditions and regulations that maintain those traditions, then what happens when you bring those vines to other areas of the world? And you have people that may not have trained and maybe they open a winery because they think it'll be fun or maybe they uh, like wine or maybe they uh, have traveled around the world and said, you know, I'm gonna wine back up in Canada or wherever they might be and be experiencing wines of that area. So New World has a different approach to wine because it is new. So it has nothing to do with the age of a winery when they opened, it really is location, location, location that makes it Old World versus New World. And we see incredible wines made both Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Clo too close to the equator though, you can't grow good grapes. Too far away from the equator, you can't grow good grapes. So it's really sort of these uh, 30 to 50 degree latitude area. So we're going to see most of our grapes grown. So wine basics. And this will be really basic. Um, vineyard. Let's start in the vineyard first. And I don't have a vineyard. I don't think I have the stomach for it uh, to have a vineyard and worry every year about what's happening. But old world versus new world, you might have generation after generation after generation passing on that vineyard and their techniques and, and their history, being, open, being able to open up a book back 100 years and seeing how 
the vines grew that particular year. That, that's incredible experience versus what we might see in the new world. But there's this French term called terroir. <laughs> Hope some of my former students appreciate my word. And it's a little controversial because we talk about vines digging the roots way down, but it isn't as though they're picking up rocks and putting it into your wine, but there does seem to be sort of this environmental impact on the vine, a location that no matter when you try it, it almost has that, that real identifiable marker of where it could have come from because of how strong that location is and its impact on that vine. So we see movies like uh, Psalm and these people that are studying these certifications, uh, which can make you quite ill and spend a lot of money trying to get those certifications. But it's very involved in trying to figure out how those wines will taste from those areas. So old world tends to be very um, set in tradition and maybe the grapes that they've figured out grow best in those areas they've stuck with for years and years. New World might say, gee, um, you know, let's try planting this year, or let's uh, see how the grapes will taste out of this particular soil. So there's different things that will impact it. And the type of climate is essential. I really can say there are many people in the Finger Lakes that started out after Prohibition planting a lot of different things, but now they're sort of settling in. And one of the reasons we're known internationally for Riesling because if we figured out that this is a good climate for it. So um, I've got my little happy face. Uh, climate stays the same. So we might get into a little debate of uh, climate change, and there's certainly some warming in areas and extremes in these areas, but that location doesn't change. I'm always in the Finger Lakes. That doesn't change. And so here, we're a continental climate away from a large body of water. So a cool climate, a cooler climate means my grapes aren't going to have as long a growing season. So I'm going to see less red grapes planted here. And um, those are going to be wines then that have a tendency to have great acidity and great food wines. So continental climate, I'm away from big bodies of water that help moderate temperature. In the Finger Lakes, we have the Finger Lakes that help a little, but it's nowhere near something like the Mediterranean Sea. So the Mediterranean Sea is huge, and you could be located near that sea where it's going to be much warmer and very consistent throughout your growing season, throughout the year, and no rain seen as much during uh, the harvest time, which is key to the growth. And you'll see more red vines, red grapes grown there. Um, Maritime's kind of in between. So if I say I'm in Rochester, but my family, I have family on Long Island, Long Island's surrounded by water. That's a maritime climate. It's a little warmer, but it's not as warm as Mediterranean, and it has a longer growing season than here. And so my same grape, my Chardonnay planted in the Finger Lakes here versus planted in maritime climate Long Island and planted in a Mediterranean climate, those are going to taste very, very different, not because of much of anything other than, well, winemaker influence, but climate. So weather can change year to year. And that could be very different year to year, again, depending on your climate. And that will affect how your, your wines turn out. So in this area, we tend to see wines that can vary a little bit more year after year. Or in Mediterranean climate, for some of the vineyards out in California or Australia, we might not see as much of a variation from year to year. So a little more dependable when you go to buy them. But there can be a little excitement and not knowing exactly what's going on from year to year in some of these other cooler climate regions. So definitely big impact first on our, on our grapes. Weather, okay, soil. Okay, how far does that soil go? What type of soils is it going through? How easy is it for the roots to dig down? And there are definitely inst instances um, I saw in Argentina of flooding vineyards and getting higher yields. In Chile, of higher yielding uh, vines because they flooded them and you'd get lots and lots of grapes per, per acre, hectare. Uh, but then your vines are shallow. And for any of you who grow different plants, you know that with those shallow roots then, or trees, that maybe they're not going to be as sturdy or as hardy long term. So that can impact how our grapes grow. Grape selection. Uh, what grapes are planted certain areas, what different clones. And we're not going to send in the clones right now, but we'll keep moving. And, okay, diseases, fungi, and pests, oh my, every area has something. Uh, one of the times I was in Chile, they said, well, we really don't have problems with a lot of pests or anything. Um, they did see a puma track the other day. I'm like, okay, going to go back to Rochester. So um, 
what you can't quite see here, but hopefully maybe you can. Some of these roots going right down through this cross section of soil and seeing how far they go down and what different soils you might see and being able to pick up from there the water that they might need. So wine basics. Okay, old world versus new world. There are so many changes in the wine world. Uh, great quality. Uh, one of the places I went to in California once, they said, hey, you want to take a tour of the winery? I'm like, well, okay, but I'd really like to get out in the vineyard. That's where the wine is, so to speak, made, that we really need to start with good grapes or you're not going to have good wine. You can make bad wine out of good grapes, but you can't make great wine out of bad grapes. So it's very important to have those good grapes and quality being a whole team effort very often. And maybe in a continental climate, you might have to pick earlier than you'd want because there might be rain coming in because we see that often in during harvest. Or other times, maybe we have to pick early to get higher acid in our grapes because the acid will be higher in a grape's lifetime on the vine earlier until they start to ripen more and the acidity might drop and then sugar increasing. And I tell people you got to watch out for those grapes dropping acid because, well, anyway, moving right along. Uh, fermentation. Fermentation will be different for reds and whites and very often reds will be at a higher temperature to get more extraction of color out of the skins because if I just press a red grape, the juice will most likely come out clear and just like a green grape being crushed. And so if I get that, I really need that skin contact to give it more color. And whether I'm making a rosé or a strong, deeply colored red, I'm going to get that red color from those skins. So fermentation will be different, different temperatures, different maybe length of time for reds versus whites and whites usually. The white wines are usually done at a little bit cooler temperature so that we can see all of those great aromatics and, and more delicate flavors that would be from a green grape going into your white wine. Well, do I ferment in a tank? Do I ferment in a barrel? There's things now where we might be fermenting and aging in concrete eggs. And there's something to be said about the distribution within that egg uh, shape with these concrete with this porous sort of quality that might add a little bit more air exchange with our wine. And so there's all these different choices and expensive choices that might go into it. And now we see, some of you have probably seen orange wines. Orange wines that are made from green grapes that traditionally we might see very pale in color, but now orange wines made with green grapes that will maintain some contact with the skin, which adds a different texture, adds different uh, components to that eventual wine. And we might see these orange wines being created buried in clay amphoras that are buried in the ground, which was traditional many, many years ago. And so what's old might be new again. And we see those choices every step of the way that the winemaker is involved, that that vineyard person might be different than the winemaker, or they might be all involved at all levels, same person. But all of these choices can make dramatic impact on yeah. that wine. So uh, did you have a question, Lydia? Uh, yeah, just one quick question. So you mentioned sure. at the very beginning that it's mostly water. Um, mm -hmm. And so that begs the question, uh, does the source of the water at the various wineries have a significant impact or are wineries doing things to try to uh, improve the quality of the water that they've got? Because water is an issue around the world. So where yeah. is that taking us? So the water that I'm talking about in the wine is coming from the grape itself. So water that we're talking about maybe for using uh, cleaning a winery and things like that, that, um, that can be very uh, that can be very tough. And so if we're talking about water that we get from a grape and a wine, if we're talking about a drought area, and that's another water issue, water rights, that can impact greatly how concentrated our wine, our grapes are that are going to be made into wine. So when I say the wine itself is made out of primarily the water, about, you know, almost, almost all of it, that's coming from the grape itself. We're not adding water to our wines. Um, so very rarely. Uh, you could, but we're not going to get off topic with some of the other regulations and other areas of the world that we couldn't do that. But water in the vineyards definitely impactful. So that's why you can dry farm grapes um, if their roots are deep enough. Uh, 
But if you have young vines, they need water. If you have uh, newer vineyards that need irrigation, that can be an issue. But the wine in and of itself, when I'm talking about how much a percentage of that is so high, it's water, that's coming from the grape itself. Um, so there's definitely reclaiming uh, issues in the wineries when we're talking about winemaking, when we're cleaning and, and trying to reclaim and clean that water up. We don't want to be disposing of something that might harm the environment. So we see a big trend, uh, sustainability, accountability, uh, that maybe people are going into organic and biodynamic. And those become certification choices that um, are a little more complicated and having to do with even your neighbor's impact on your own land and whether you're practicing uh, safe practices, that's that's key. Um, and so we're seeing maybe getting away from some technology in a way that um, incorporating, hey, you know, bring over the chicken coop and let them go out and work the vineyard for a day instead of uh, maybe herbicides and things uh, that, again, might impact, especially with runoff in certain areas. So you see very often these vineyards that are going to be on slopes and that's really key for drainage. And, but if something drains, we want to make sure we're not putting too much onto that land that isn't going to be healthy. So it's a great question. Um, back to the winemaking, uh, maybe we're using some oak barrels for ferment fermentation, but uh, we might also use barrels that we're going to age our wine in. So maybe we want to maintain more pure, fresh, young, vibrant flavors and uh, no oak. Or maybe we want to keep that in stainless steel so that it doesn't have any air getting to it. But maybe we want to have a little bit of introduction of some oaky flavors. And oak being maybe smoky, toasty, caramel, buttery, all sorts of things that you could get by time and oak. Um, that could also change with the age of the barrel. It can change with where the barrels uh, oak staves, where that tree was originally planted, can impact that wine depending on how they make that barrel. And then there's even some barrels that might have French and American, French and American oak staves inside of it, alternating. So you're getting a little bit of both without buying two different barrels. So forest and how that barrel is made, those can impact and how long you leave that wine in there. There's all these choices. Um, I'd much rather be on the winery end of it though than the vineyard. Again, I, I just would worry about the weather up here. But on the other hand, all those choices. And can you afford it? Do you have the space to store these barrels? And when the barrels are empty, you still have to fill them up with water and keep them um, full or they'll shrink up and start to leak when you put wine back in them again. So it's not, not easy um, decision making. So um, here's something for my packaging science people. All these alternative packagings and closures and labels. And if we're doing some carbon footprint considerations, do you have uh, the dyes for those uh, labels and the inks used? Are the closure, is it going to be a natural cork? Is it going to be artificial cork? Is that packaging going to be alternative three liter bag in the box? Or uh, maybe just a one liter Tetra pack? So there's all sorts of different choices made at that winemaking side. So basically three types of wines. That's it, three types of wines really. You have your still wine, this is gonna sound very British and certification-like, but your table wines, your still wines. And that's what the majority of the wines are from around the world, reds, whites, rosés. That's what we're talking about because they don't have any bubbles. That's something that we can introduce later at the next level. Uh, but they're usually around 8 to 15 or 16 percent alcohol by volume now. So those, uh, that's a pretty big range. So maybe something light and delicate when it's really hot outside. Because if I put a high alcohol wine in my mouth when it's 95 out, guess what? That's going to turn that into real alcoholic vapors. And that's not the best way to try a wine. And it also brings me to the point where before I had AC put in, that if I was sitting in my house, I would, um, I would know exactly what wine to serve, judging by how far out of the mouth, my dog's mouth, his tongue would fall. Because if it was really close, I was like, okay, I can drink a red wine. If it was further out, he's, <laughs> I know that I'm not going to be drinking a big red alcoholic wine because it's too hot in the house. So, okay, room temperature. Well, what room? Uh, castle temperature might be a closer approximation because 
it, we're really talking about maybe more 60, 65 degrees to serve a red wine. Whites, we tend to pull out of the fridge and pour it quickly. That's probably too cold for our taste buds and can freeze up everything. And then we're not letting the beautiful aromatics out as much. So with our still wines, uh, watch that alcohol level and figure out maybe that'll help you with temperature decisions outside and inside and how you're serving it. If you want to throw a cube in it like my aunt does to lower the temperature of her Chardonnay, go for it. It's your wine if you bought it. Uh, sparkling wines, how do they get the bubbles? So there could be these very long traditional methods like they use in Champagne, France, very regulated exactly how long you can age it before it's released. Or maybe you go back to something that my dad did with a CO2 cartridge. It was on a smaller scale, but you can inject bubble these days. And there's some fabulous wines out there that are just injecting bubbles and they're less expensive and fun and uh, delicious. So there's other ways in between and bulk process and big tanks. There's many different ways to get the bubbles into your wine. And those bubbles can be festive. I never liked bubbles. I don't drink soda or pop, depending on where you live. But um, I've grown to appreciate sparkling wines. So once you begin to understand some of it and, and get into it a little bit, I just found that I love bubbles now. And I don't wait for a special occasion. And quite honestly, it's Monday night. If you want to open up a bottle of sparkling wine, people might say, well, what's the special occasion? It's Monday. And I want something that's going to go well with a variety of foods, perhaps. And those scrubbing bubbles and uh, sparkling wines can do that. Question for me? Yep, quick question. Um, so you're referring to three types of wine. Uh, question is, what about Verde wines? Some tend to be a little Ooh. effervescent. Yeah, Vino Verde. Um, that's perfect. That's on the lower end of the alcohol level, and that will go at clam bakes. It's, it's a Portuguese wine that really, if you think about Portuguese and the fisherman attitude of get, being all along that coast, the seafood you had, and whether it's very fresh and briny, whether it's uh, got some butter on it, a Vino Verde has naturally a little effervescence that they've left in there after the fermentation. And it can be a blend of different grapes you've never heard of before. And if you like it, go for it because it tends to be inexpensive. It's a regional uh, from that area of Portugal. It's just a, a fun wine that goes with a variety of foods. It's not so big and bold that'll stand up to uh, big and bold food, but it's fun anytime. And some of that bubble tricks your brain into thinking it's a little more acidic and that can make your mouth water and tell your stomach it's time for food. So maybe bring Vino Verde out as, and that would be considered a still wine um, and have that with just appetizers, salty chips and that creamy uh, cheese, whatever that might be. Vino Verde is exactly dead on. I hope somebody's drinking it tonight. Uh, a great summer wine. That's um, great. So, yeah, so not sparkling wine, but a great question because that's that's perfect this time of year. Uh, think about it with salty buttered corn at a clam bake. Uh, anyway, okay, so fortified wine, yeah. our third <laughs> category. <laughs> that's not something I want to drink on a 95 degree a day. Even though fortified with adding alcohol to my wine, it depends on when it's added, those can run from dry to sweet. And certainly throughout history, we've seen these fortified wines um, coming about maybe a little bit by accident. Maybe wine was put in ships. Maybe the English uh, were traveling around to the Far East and they would stop in Portugal or along the way in South Africa and pick up wine for ballast in the boats and maybe then eventually get wine for uh, almost food, you know, that became the beverage that uh, would help them along. Not, not preventing scurvy, unless I guess we had some limes. But then if I add alcohol to it, it can make it more stable. It can last longer. And maybe if I add sugar to it, there's a double whammy of, of uh, goodness for ageability. So I might get it over to that Far East, drop that ballast off when I'm picking up my goods, but maybe some barrels came back and they noticed that seaworthy sort of travel uh, would change the wine. And so we saw, well, not supposedly, we saw Madeira from the island of Madeira, a fortified wine coming over to the U.S. and um, nicknamed sort of the wine of the presidents because it was stable. It didn't come, up, didn't have the travel issues that other wines from Europe would have. So fortified wines, most popular, sherries, which can run dry to sweet. They're fermented after fermentation. Port, which a lot of people are familiar with, is always sweet, almost always red, and that would definitely be served after dinner. You might have a port reduction, 
um, in your main meal. But if we're talking about port served during a meal at, at about 20% alcohol, yeah, that's going to be the end of your meal. You won't have to worry about dessert. So maybe save some money and don't have dessert. But this, this alcohol added, um, that's going to make a big difference, uh, fortified wines and when they're served. If I'm talking maybe a drier sherry, a little lighter alcohol, that's where you might hear it at tea time or before dinner. So a wide variety of all of these types of wines. Another question? Yeah, uh, ice wine, is that fortified? Ice wine is not fortified. You could have a fortified ice wine, but ice wine usually runs around 8 to 11% alcohol. And it's the traditional style would be picked grapes while frozen, pressed while frozen, and you're going to get out there on a really cold morning, maybe even in the dark, picking those berries that have hung on the vine into November, December, January, February, and uh, just getting a little drop of liquid out of each of those grapes after the ice has been removed. So that would be a still wine and usually see those in half bottles because it's super sweet, maybe only serving about two ounces of this or fortified wines that are so intense versus maybe a four ounce of something like a regular table wine or a sparkling wine. So ice wine would be falling into that still wine category. I've had sparkling ice wine from uh, Canada before and that's really good too. Uh, usually, usually more dessert or savory dishes. Another uh, question? Yeah, another question. Can white wines age or evolve in flavor in stainless steel as a, in contrast to in barrels? Not really. And so one of the reasons it's put into the stainless steel until maybe it's ready for bottling, you might see a turnaround of harvest in the fall of the one year and bottling in the spring of the next year um, just to get it out and fresh because it really isn't going to change in that big tank and you might need those tanks soon for something else and blending uh, but those no we're really not going to see that change so that's why you'll see um, very often now even unoaked on some bottles of white and reds that'll just say no nope, we're uh, stainless steel to maintain more of that fruit and without at, if I put my wine in an oak barrel it might change mouthfeel it might change um, how it's going to taste and I might lose some of that fruit so it'll be a trade-off I might be picking up some really interesting and complex fla flavors from having it age in oak but I might lose some of that fruit or changing that fruit so it depends what kind of person you are and I'll actually talk a little about a bit about that at the end here it's a great question. Another and question. One last question, and if you're going to get to glassware, let us know. But uh, does the shape of a glass truly affect the quality and the taste of a wine? It won't affect the quality because the quality will be in that glass. Um, a lot of my students, my former students, students know that uh, friends know. I have a collection of glasses in my basement. If something new comes out. I'm there. I'm very uh, susceptible to advertising, very gullible. Uh, but I have done uh, Riedel, probably Riedel is the most famous glassware producer that um, talked about glass shape and how wine would flow into your mouth and how your neck would go back on certain varieties, certain grape types. And I do have certain um, different bowl shapes and thinness of the glass, so the less that comes between your your mouth, your tongue, and that wine, the better. Um, and I use Riedel for my glasses at school for some of my classes. Uh, what I don't like are those rolled lips, sort of thicker glass things, because that acts almost like a dam of having the wine flow into your mouth well. So in my opinion, yes, you'll see a difference. When I serve different glass shapes with my students with different wines, there's definitely a difference. You know, But whether it's worth a price of a glass difference, what Riedel's philosophy has also been through the ages has been if you drink a $10 bottle, here's a glass for you. And if you drink a $25 bottle of wine regularly, here's maybe another glass made in a different production style for you. And if you're drinking $100 bottles, there's a glass for you. <laughs> and maybe you don't worry about But by the time you get up there with these mouth-blown, very, very thin glass 
uh, glasses. That's a whole different experience. So, um, and at that price range, I have a different experience because I'm worried about breaking them. So I don't use them often. So I usually use just sort of a traditional um, shape. This is sort of a universal shape right here. If I back out that a little bit, and I'll use this for whites, reds, rosés. Um, but red wine's usually the bowl's a little bigger. And you don't mind if the wine is in a little more quantity because then um, it, if it warms up a little bit, it's not a big deal. And you have more space in there to really open it up and swirl it around. With white wines, it might be served a little cooler and more delicate. You don't want to serve as much. And so the glass might be a little bit smaller. But um, if anyone's tried Pinot Noir out of a Pinot Noir glass, that, that's my favorite pairing um, when we talk about glassware and wine. But yeah, probably another topic, but it's a great question because, um, you know, try using plastic glass, styrofoam glass, and a couple different shapes of glasses at home, and you will see a difference. And again, maybe you don't like the difference of using a Riedel glass as opposed to the one you use. Um, but that'll lead me into stemless, and I fight the stemless a little bit because it's so anti-Riedel, uh, and yet they came out with their own stemless glasses. Uh, there, there's a purpose, there's a reason for them. And I use those quite a bit, um, but I, I can't get my hand around those big, wide, bold, uh, stemless ones. But uh, yeah, there, there's a glass for everybody. There's a glass for every grape. So we can find you something. I'll be happy to recommend some, or just stay with what you got. So talking about preferences, uh, I went to a, a Society of Wine Education conference once in Monterey. I think that's where I was for sure, for sure, because I was scarred for life. And the room was filled with, I don't know, maybe 500 educators, and wine educators. So we're supposed to know our stuff, okay? And yeah, some of them are pretty darn snobby. And that's not my approach, but uh, Tim Honey got up there, and he's a master sommelier. And he said, this is the start of our conference. You're all teaching it wrong. And he said, you're boring people with details about pH and residual sugar, and you're boring people with all these details about how a wine is made. You know, tell me something about, do you like it? And uh, maybe there's a story behind it. Sell me on what it is that makes it special. Because again, going back to personal preference, what his example was, if you were in Italy and you saw in that shop window a pair of shoes, handmade, leather shoe by this this uh, cobbler who had been doing it for years and years, and you walk in and you say, I love that shoe in the window. And he said, okay, well, uh, you know, what size? And well, he only had it in a size and a half smaller than the person that went in, went in to buy it. And the person says, well, gee, you know, I, I, you know I, I don't think it fits well. And he said, but it's the last one. It's the last pair. And it's handmade. I'm like, okay, I'll buy it. And it's not a good fit. And so to have somebody say to you, Oh, this French wine was made from grapes on a hillside surrounded by little white flowers and the goats that come up. You know, if you don't like it, you, you spend your time going, well, gee, it must be something wrong with me if, if I don't like this wine. They said it was good. It got 100 points. And, oh, darn it, I guess maybe I shouldn't drink wine. Drink wine. Uh, get into it. But his point being, if we're teaching it wrong, how are we not, you know, scaring people away? And so this surge in wine consumption during um, isolation, uh, maybe people are drinking more wine for different reasons, but maybe they're exploring a little bit more for, um, I, I want to see some different wines. I don't want to keep drinking the same thing over and over. And I encourage you to be open to some of that or try maybe the same grape that you like from another country, because it can be so exciting. Maybe now you'll know you don't like it and for what reasons. But I'll tell students to take the, the course, look, try all the wines. You paid for it with your lab fee. Um, but try all the wines, and then you'll learn a, a lot about yourself by what you don't like about the wines that you don't like. And you don't ever have to be forced to drink them again. But that begins to separate out why I like what I like about the wines that I do like. And being able to describe it to somebody. So when you go into a store or a winery, I like these wines because. And that'll help you. Well, Tim's point was... Um, he did some uh, work with uh, your taste buds and trying to figure out who were special tasters. Super tasters was this phrase that came out. And uh, maybe people 
uh, attending tonight. They don't like cilantro. It tastes soapy. It tastes yucky to them. Well, that's a different sensitivity. And maybe you don't like broccoli. That's a different sensitivity. So to try and make you drink something that gets that visceral reaction from you, that's not a good thing to do. So he has come up with something. It's not I mean, he's done different things through the years, but this is the My Venotype, trying to figure out what wines I like. And I love this, and you've seen over the last few years, I think this was set up in 2011, this particular site. But you'll see over the last few years these wine clubs. Why do these wine clubs appeal to people so much? Well, for $16, and I get a discount, now it's down to $13. That might be what I spend at a local winery, but now it's delivered to me, and it's it's surprise wines, and they, they know what I like. Well, they know what you like because you filled out a preference ahead of time. And... Um, it's been referred to a little bit almost like that blockbuster. If you liked this movie, you might like this wine sort of thing, if people remember blockbuster. But it is something that serves as a guide. And so the more you like or dislike about something, they can predict what wines you will like. And son of a gun, it works for me, even if my, my preferences have changed. But you'll see some wine clubs say, do you like strong coffee? Do you prefer delicate tea? Do you like salty foods? Do you prefer chocolate? Do you like, so, okay, sweet, salty, spicy, snobby. This, this particular one asked, um, do I just want to be smarter than anyone else in the room? Uh, well, okay, if that's the type of wine you like, then there's probably a good selection of wines out there for you too. Um, and there are those occasions too where you want to celebrate. So for instance, I like large format models. So behind me, I have a six liter empty, I won't tell you who helped. And then right next to is a 15 liter. I've never had a 15 liter bottle of wine. And um, I'm going to need a really good group of people to open that with. But that's something that I have a preference for. I really like rosé. That's that's French rosé. Uh, but going through this list, I can predict that I will like rosé because of my preferences of food and maybe texture. So one of the questions, and it sounds silly, but it said, do you prefer soft towels to some of these other crazy things? So if you take this test, it will tell you what wine. It'll predict what wine you like and why. So if you like, um, are you a tolerant taster? Do you like a wide variety of, of beverages and maybe foods? Are you more sensitive? Are you hypersensitive? Or do you just prefer sweet? And there are definitely people out there that say, you know, all these other fancy wines and more expensive wines, I'm just happy with Red Cat or Lake Niagara or whatever it might be. That's fine. And some of the reasons New York State wines have gained in popularity is we produce wines here out of such a diverse group of grapes that we can make wines that other states don't produce. They're like, oh, well, who would drink this kind? And we make meads, and we make all these different sort of um, uh, wines that people might not have even heard of before. So we do have that advantage here. And that's why I said tonight, okay, New York, and next time we get together, we can do more New York. Uh, but um, French wine, we had to start with that. But here we are with predictors and conclusions about the types of wines you would like. I don't like maybe as much of the big, rich Cabernet Sauvignons, or on certain occasions I will, especially with food, but I might love my Rieslings because there's a touch of sweetness when I'm eating my, uh, what am I having tonight? Um, some, uh, some Thai dish uh, that'll be a little spicy. So it can vary a little bit on what the occasion is, but in general, what you like um, in food and some of these other things can predict what wines you'll like. And was there a question, Lydia? Yep, uh, a couple people are asking about wine diffusers. Do they make a difference? Oh, okay. Do they work? Yeah, the aerators. Um, I have some good friends at Cornell that'll say, you know, all these different um, things that'll decant and, and uh, wine uh, aerators and things. I said, if you pour the wine out <laughs> 10 minutes early, it, you know, you'll, you'll have probably the same effect. Uh, but if I were to serve my students in my class, which I've done before, here's the glass, here's one ounce of wine that goes through the aerator, here's, a, here's an ounce that comes right out of the bottle, there's a difference. So I had some a customer when I used to work retail that he bought 10 cases of wine at a time, and so he wouldn't see them often, 
and he would decant every single bottle of wine. He said it makes a difference. Like, I'm, I'm sure it does, you know, even with your $5 bottles. I'm sure it does. So whether that's your preference, though, it will change your aroma and flavor. So depending on what you want to do, if it's a wine that's maybe too young to really fully appreciate without trying to get more air into it to open it up, then you certainly use an, uh, use an aerator because they're not expensive. You know, don't, don't buy something really fancy. But, yeah, sure, those are definitely things that can be fun because if you have people that are open to it and you try that um, experiment with one straight from a bottle and some from the, through the aerator, it's, it's fun to play around with different wines and things, uh, tools, we'll say. So the next class is going to be the Super 7. Uh, we talk about maybe the six great uh, grapes of the world, and that usually includes Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, and then for the Reds, Pinot Noir, Merlot, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. But we're going to go Super 7, and Syrah has to really pop up in there. It might not be in as many places as the others, but um, there are specific climates, there are specific soils, there are specific areas of the world that are very well known for these. Um, so my Wine 101 Part 2 on Monday, August 3rd, we're going to stay with a Monday because um, I don't know, what else do you have to do on a Monday? Um, we're, we're going to have uh, some fun talking about just some of the basic characteristics of those. And so we see very often when I'm teaching a certification course, we'll start with the French Riesling example and maybe compare it to another area of the world. This Sauvignon Blanc example and then comparing it to somewhere else in the world. Chardonnay, same with the whole list. You can find um, New York State versions. So what we might do, depending on how you want to set it up, you might buy um, any of the French ones of those. Uh, we're not going to probably drink seven bottles in this time period, but have some other friends with you and help you. Um, also, uh, we'll probably recommend some alums that are associated with some of the local wineries and recommend some of the wines that they do that would work with this idea. And so maybe you want to do a pairing with a French and a Finger Lakes or something along those lines. So those are what we'll look at for part two. And obviously we can keep going with wine webinars forever and ever and ever. Um, but I, I love doing these. I love um, having different people experience it and teach me as we go through and the stories you have. And the way I have these arranged really are a little bit from usually lighter bodied to fuller bodied. And if you want to bring cheeses, I can make some cheese recommendations too, or food recommendations. And we can just have some fun with that with the next one. Uh, but there's about 10,000 different grapes around the world. So <laughs> we'll, we'll stick with seven for the next session. And you had a question, Lydia? <laughs> we're, ju we're just going to keep going until we hit all 10,000 of them, Lorraine. How's that? Okay. <laughs> so, so one thing I am committed to do is that I will download the chat that has been running alongside Good. your webinar because there are many messages for you okay. um, and some messages between some of our attendees that I'm sure you'll get a kick out of. I'm so, sure I will. I'm I sure have I to tell you, I've been enjoying watching their comments. So we really... <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, we do have a question. Uh, we're going to go back to the vineyards yes. where you started. Is it true that France is forbidden to irrigate vineyards? And is that different than other countries? Yeah, it can be very different. Um, there are certain areas of the world, France in particular, if you're in an area where it would already maybe naturally get rain, then they won't allow irrigation. And can you make exceptions? So, for instance, one year I was in Germany, and it had been a very, very, very hot year. And so they asked uh, for the ability to add acid, which they wouldn't normally have to do in that cooler climate, to balance out the ripeness of those grapes, to balance that out. Um, and so they were given some special permissions. But there are many areas of the world you're not allowed to irrigate, and whether it's tied to a little bit of water issue and the fact that traditionally it's been this region. And so with the little smiley face back on the climate, um, there are different areas of the world now where, hey, these are the only grapes you can plant, and they're petitioning, can we try these other varieties? Maybe not to make into wine yet, but if there's some warming occurring and we're not seeing the characteristics we saw or running into different issues with the grapes we have had planted there, can we be a little more flexible and be ahead of the curve of what might be coming down the road in 30 years or more? 
So um, yes, it is illegal to irrigate in some of those areas. <laughs> They're so strict. <laughs> um, so I know I've had questions along the way, so I'll pop to that. <laughs> As um, I love all. Question about aging wine. Uh, why do some wines seem to be better aged for years and some don't? And then I think a corollary to that is, should you really be trying to pay attention to the year on the bottle of the wine? And I think that when I had mentioned earlier, cooler climates have some vintage variation. So one year might be warmer, the next year is different. Um, we don't see as much of a variance in those areas of the world where we might see or like a Mediterranean climate. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Thank you. And so California, we don't usually pay attention to your $12 bottles. Don't usually make a difference from year to year, but it can definitely make a difference in some areas of the world. So um, it depends on what wine you what wine you like. And it really comes down to that because it really won't make that much of a difference that you would see. And you might say, well, this wine tastes a little different, but then you have to remember maybe the previous vintage you had had already been on the shelf or in your basement for a year. So of course that had changed. Then you bump into a new year. It might not be that different again in 12 months, but it might make a difference. So um, aging, most of the wines of the world these days, if we're talking about $15 and less, whites they usually recommend maybe two to three years, reds maybe three to five years, but Wineries traditionally had been, yeah, we're making wines that can age. And they lived in the same house, generation after generation after generation, and that was their cellar. But if you look at Australia, one of the key things that made them so popular with something like Yellowtail, it's drink now. How many people have gone to the store tonight to say, I wanna buy a bottle for tonight and another one for 10 years from now? No, probably not. So drinkability has been a key shift um, through the years, especially with the new world. I want to drink it now. We're not, my college students have been in how many homes? Different, you know, travel and apartments and things. So having a wine cellar where you could age something properly with the humidity, the temperature, uh, that's not as realistic for some people. But most of the wines we're consuming are meant to drink now. Um, maybe a little bit of aging, maybe a little aerating, but most are, are made winemaker knowing that you're going to buy that bottle and consume it within a few hours. So does that mean if you have a bottle that's several years old in your <laughs> wine cellar, you should... You need, you need to bring it here so I can evaluate it with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah you, it depends. If it's been stored properly, maybe it's no big deal. Don't store anything long-term and expect it to last in your fridge. The fridge is vibration, not the humidity, not the light. Everything is wrong for storing anything in your fridge for very long. But thank goodness for screw caps. That helps. Yes. And so that's a really good question. Having spent uh, some time at a cookout uh, the other weekend trying to figure out how to open a bottle with a cork in it because we didn't have a corkscrew. Yeah. Our yeah. screw tops, good. Yeah, or... did you? Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, screw caps. Um, when you look at something like New Zealand, it's gone almost exclusively screw cap. Uh, there are reasons for that. And you usually see it predominantly has been uh, initially with more aromatic white wines, Riesling being one of those. That works. And we usually consider screw cap and it's off. If you're talking about the romance of opening up a cork, then that gets into sometimes cork issues that uh, a cork might not have been sterilized properly. And you hate to have something in an expensive bottle with a bad cork. And I had a California wine where they said, the, uh, the bottle with the cork will be 115 at the winery or 125 with screw cap. Like, well, why would I pay extra for a screw cap? I mean, cork's what you want with an expensive wine. He said, when you get home and it's corked, would you rather have, I'm like, I'll take the 125. So um, <laughs> screw caps are really, they're, they're here to stay and they're not our grandfather's screw caps uh, that were on for, well, a gallon jugs of, of Carlo Rossi or something. So yep. I think you're back to those packaging alumni, yeah, right? Yeah, They've definitely. done a better job of figuring out, figuring out how to make that work. Definitely. Um, so last question, is Beaujolais Nouveau a marketing gimmick? Um, I think a lot of people consider it that, but let's throw a party. I love this stuff. 
Um, it really is a divisive one. <laughs> People are like, eh! Um, it's not intended for anything other than opening up in uh, around Thanksgiving time, harvest celebration. And there are many other areas of the world where it really will be that sort of style of wine uh, made, maybe a young uh, German wine or a young, we've done Nouveau in the Finger Lakes. So it's it's more of a celebration. If we treat it like that, it's fun. If It's not serious wine. It's not ever intended to be. So, hey, gimmick, it's, it's transported all over the world. You should see people swimming in it in Japan. So uh, it's worked. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Lorraine. Uh, oh, this has been you. great. And uh, so that those of you who uh, heard her mention that we are having a part two to this, uh, it will be on August 3rd. So keep your eyes open to your email uh, because we will let you know when that is all set up and ready to register. Um, I also will commit to our friends here online that I will try to find out how to turn off the little bleep. <laughs> the chatting. I do not, I can't figure out how to do that, but we will call the webinar company and find out how to make that happen. So no, by, I uh, by August 3rd, we will have that fixed. Um, so uh, please, as a reminder, uh, you will receive an email from us in about a week with a link to the webinar recording so that you can review it again. If you do have additional questions, you can email them to RIT alum at rit.edu and we'll direct your questions to Lorraine. Um, we will, uh, I'm sorry, you can see this event uh, and a full listing of upcoming virtual events at rit.edu slash alumni slash events for a listing of everything that is upcoming. Um, and when, as I said, when we do get the August 3rd event up there, you will find that as well and it will be an easy registration for you. Uh, we do have several virtual events coming up over the next few weeks, and we want to include you all in as many as possible. Please go ahead and exit the webinar by just closing your browser window, and do let us know what you thought through a brief survey that you will receive via email. Have a wonderful evening, and everyone, please stay safe. Bye-bye.